welcome to my lab at uh, UC Irvine. We're in the Department of Chemistry. And today I'm going to be making a cocktail with you that I'm really excited about. It's one we've invented. We call it the Anteater's Punch. Stay tuned. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk to you about the, um, the chemistry that's involved. And uh, this is my true passion, which is changing and making things that otherwise seem impossible. For example, a number of years ago, we did this experiment where we took a hard boiled egg and then converted it back to its unboiled state, back to the liquid state. So it's solid egg goes back to liquid. That sort of chemical process fascinates me. I love transitions of matter, changes of states from solid to liquid. And that's what I want to share with you today. Turns out cocktails are one of those uh, um, processes that involve some transitions of matter and changes of states, oftentimes though in unexpected ways. Okay, so today what I've done for you is I've invented a new cocktail that we're gonna introduce in a moment, but I've also, we've invented a new way to even make cocktails. And so before I get to that, let me introduce one of the super talented graduate students who's on my team. Michael? So uh, tell us about yourself, Michael. Hey, fellow anteaters. I'm Michael Spano, and uh, I am a chemist here in Professor Weiss's lab, and I do all things chemistry, biochemistry, and engineering. So I'll be operating the Vortex Fluidic device so we can get the perfect drink with the perfect crystal structure of the ice. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so before we get to Michael's invention, let me talk to you a little bit about why cocktails are so interesting uh, and such a, a fertile area for invention. So I like to think of cocktails, when you, when you shake a cocktail, that you're sort of cooking it by cooling it down. So unlike the cooking where you go to a microwave oven or a broiler or something and you heat stuff up, a cocktail is the exact opposite. The goal is to cool things down in a controlled way so you get to the optimal temperature that has all the nuanced flavors and subtle aromas and all that great stuff, including the mouthfeel that we're going for in a good cocktail. So today, uh, I thought that we would do something a little different, that we would come up with a better way of making a cocktail. And in the same way that when you use a microwave oven versus, say, your stove, you get a very different uh, outcome, right? If you cook in the microwave, you get one kind of uh, outcome. But if you cook on the stove, you get something totally different, right? So that's familiar to everybody. Cocktails are the same way. So the classic way of making a cocktail is to shake it in a cocktail shaker like this one. And we'll be doing that today, but I bet that there's a better way to do this. And the reason I know that is when I use my shaker, it ends up with little ice chips in it. And I have one of these funnels that I use to pull out the ice chips. The problem with all this though, is that the ice slightly melts into the cocktail. And so in doing that, I'm diluting the cocktail. I'm changing it from what I was going to expect. So uh, today we're going to use a new device that we've invented to avoid that entirely, okay? So we're gonna avoid having any dilution through adding ice. And in addition, we're gonna avoid um, having the contents of the drink also freeze because that creates little ice chips. And those ice chips I find annoying. Okay, so um, to illustrate uh, this new device, I'm gonna turn things over to Michael. Before I do, let me just say that this Vortex Fluidic device is the same one that we use for unboiling an egg. It's this device that allows us to drive matter from liquid to solid and back. Okay, so um, one of the great things about my job here at UCI is I get to work with amazing graduate students. And I called Michael up on the phone the other day and I said, Michael, we, we, have, we wanna share this thing for homecoming. It's gotta be this new way. Why don't we see what we can do with the VFD? And Michael delivered, he invented a new way of cooling things and I'm excited about this. I actually think we can patent it. Um, maybe not for cocktails, but there's a chemical reason for wanting to do this. Okay, so without further ado, Michael, why don't you show us what you've done? So here we have the Vortex Fluidic device and I've rigged a liquid nitrogen heat exchanger which is constantly blowing ultra cold gas onto the Vortex Fluidic device tube. So using a syringe pump that I made, I'll be able to add the cocktail in a controlled fashion through the top and we'll vortex it at the perfect rate to chill it and make the perfect anteater punch. Okay, 
a couple of subtleties to uh, introduce what Michael just told you. The Vortex Fluidic device whirls at a very, very high speed. So it's going to be rotating at literally thousands of RPMs. It won't look like that. It's going to look like a lot slower speed, but it'll be whirling really fast. Doing that puts mechanical energy into the cocktail and forces apart any ice crystals that might form. So this has the effect of ensuring that we get tiny little ice crystals. Now I know what you're thinking. I know that you're at home wondering, why do I care about ice crystals? Ice crystals are the key to a good cocktail. They're the key to any sort of food that you eat that's chilled. And I'll give you a quick example to illustrate this. Ice cream, right? So ice cream, the ice cream that tastes good, that has the nice smooth taste, has tiny, tiny little ice crystals. And it turns out your tongue is superbly sensitive to the size of those ice crystals. You know, for example, that if you leave your ice cream out and then put it back in the freezer, the ice crystal size changes. And after that, it tastes kind of gritty, right? It loses that smoothness uh, when you freeze and uh, thaw and freeze and thaw your ice cream. So humans, like ourselves, are superbly sensitive to ice crystal size, and that applies to cocktails as well. So Michael's Vortex Fluidic device gives us a way of driving mechanical energy directly into the cocktail, preventing large crystals from forming. At the same time, it's being cooled without the addition of cold stuff, without the addition of ice that can break apart into, or melt into, to dilute the cocktail. Okay, so he's getting all the cooling by a radiative cooling mechanism. So it's sort of like a broiler, but for, uh, for cocktails, for chilling things. And that, that analogy is very apt because in the same way you have the broiler in your oven at high temperature and it beats down on the thing and you know, chars it really nicely, Michael is using liquid nitrogen to cool this. And you can actually see the, the cryogenic uh, uh, gas coming off over here. You can see how cold it is. And so this runs up here and so it's gonna be cooling it through uh, by cooling this neighboring part. But the liquid nitrogen itself doesn't touch the tube. It's going through an air gap, just like your broiler. Uh, the broiler, the heating element, doesn't actually touch what it's heating inside your oven. Okay, enough, uh, enough introduction. Let's get to the real stuff, all right? Who's ready to make cocktails? You guys ready? I'm ready. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Um, let me see. So the first ingredient is mango juice. I'm going to make one of these in my shaker, and then we're going to use the, this thing over here to cool it down. So I like cocktails that start with a nice mango juice. Uh, the thing I like about mango juice, super sweet. It also has a nice mouthfeel. It feels very smooth on the tongue. Um, one of the goals for a good cocktail is that it has lots of balance. You want balance not just in terms of flavor, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also in terms of viscosity. And that's really what we're going for here. Okay, so uh, is it two ounces? Two and, a half. two and a half, thank you. All right. Okay, so here's our two and a half ounces of mango juice and cocktails. Let's get back to flavor balance now. Good cocktails, in my mind, have a, a balanced sweetness, bitterness, uh, sourness. Um, oh, that's enough. Balance of those three. Okay, it's sort of like a good Venn diagram. You want everything nicely balanced. And so this is going to be really sweet. We're going to balance that with the sourness of lime juice. Okay, now lime juice is like a kick in the teeth. It really is a strong uh, sour thing. So um, let's see, let's, uh, let's measure this pretty carefully. What do we need? One and a half. Okay, so that's quite a bit of, mango, of uh, lime juice. We'll have to balance that out by some additional honey syrup to, to, to uh, counteract the effects of this stuff. Okay, so usually, I should say, usually I like to make my own lime juice. We have a lime tree in our, uh, in our garden, but I thought for today to be consistent, uh, we would use commercial lime juice. So that way then I can make a whole bunch of these without worrying about the you know, differences in the plinth or something like that. Okay, we got that. We're ready now for the honey. So um, I use a honey syrup to counteract the sourness of the lime juice and fill back in the sweetness that we need. So to make honey syrup, um, you take uh, one part honey, one part um, uh, water, 
just mix them one to one and heat it up until it dissolves and then allow to cool. And then you could store this stuff in your refrigerator for quite a long time, actually. I've kept this around for a while. I also like to find interesting honeys. Cocktails are one of those places where additional flavor notes really pay off. And this is honey that has um, hibiscus infused into it. So it's particularly delicious. And so that adds a delightful floral note as the top end of the cocktail. Because um, that's the other thing, we haven't mentioned this before, but you also want to balance the smells as well. So smell palettes are pretty complicated because it also depends on concentration. But uh, a little bit of hibiscus notes is detectable, especially if you have the cooling down correctly. Okay, so uh, how much honey are we gonna use? One and a half ounces. Thank you. All right. So here's our honey. Okay, so that's gonna balance out the, uh, the lime juice. I'm looking now, it looks like we're gonna run out of honey syrup. That will be a problem for us later. I'll deal with that later. <laughs> okay, we got that. Uh, let's start with the rums next, right? Okay, so now, Rums. How much time do we have to talk about rums today? <laughs> Turns out it's a great topic because the history of rum is bound up with the history of our uh, civilization, our society, even today. And um, that matters a lot, but I'm going to skip over that today. And instead, I'm going to just tell you about layering in the notes of rum. Again, you want to have balance. The thing about rums is the good ones are like dark as night. Okay, so this is a great rum. It's a 151 proof rum, but look at how dark this stuff is, okay? And so the problem there is if I cook with this, well, first at 151 proof, it's gonna knock me under the table flat, okay? That's a very strong rum. That's, uh, this is almost too strong to serve to guests. They'll, they'll uh, you know, <laughs> maybe they will wanna cover your house, but for the wrong reasons, okay? So uh, we have to balance this a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have three layers of notes and the goal for the rum balance is to balance it so that the darkness, the dark color of the rum doesn't take over um, the color of the drink because otherwise all your drinks end up looking kind of muddy. And one of the great things about cocktails is the different colors that you get, especially if you're starting with something as beautiful as mango juice, right? You wanna get that bright, bold color out. And if you put in too much of this stuff, then, uh, then you lose it. Okay, so without further ado, let's do this. Um, so how many ounces, three ounces total? Three ounces. Okay, that's quite a bit of rum. I'm gonna make it full tilt today. What I'm gonna do is this 151 stuff, that's the top end. I'm gonna use as little as that as possible. And uh, I'm gonna use a quarter ounce of that one. Okay, so just a tiny, tiny little bit of that. At uh, 151 proof, truthfully, I've got to go to work after this. I don't think I can do too much of that one. Okay, but now we're going to balance that back out by using a clear rum. So the clear rum then takes out some of the dark color of the first one. Okay, so here we go. I'm gonna use uh, uh, a total of two ounces of that one. And then I'm gonna get one ounce of kind of a mid-weight rum uh, it's one that I'm particularly uh, fond of. This is a Demerara rum. And uh, these Demerara rums have terrific molasses notes, uh, a little bit of vanilla flavor. They're, they're really great. It kind of fills in some of the flavor profile you're going for. Whereas this 151, you really don't taste it all that much. It just tastes like pretty strong alcohol. Okay, so we're gonna do one ounce of this one. Okay. And that will go in here. Okay, I think that's it. Did I get everything? Oh, okay, yeah, so that we're gonna add at the end. So this part, then you add ice, shake, cocktails ready, and then you add the seltzer water. Okay, but before we get to that, let's do the, the key step here. So do we have everything ready? Looks like it. Okay, very good. So uh, this is what we're gonna be mixing. Truthfully, this came out a little darker than I was hoping for. It's kind of the way of the world. Uh, this honey that I was using is a little darker. Maybe it was a little too long in the refrigerator, but you know what? Your guests will never know. It still tastes like honey. Okay, Michael, go for right, it. Cool. So now that we've mixed the cocktail, it's time to chill it using the Vortex fluidic device. So I'm first gonna syringe this and add it at a controlled rate because heat transfer is crucial for us to making the anteater punch.
Yeah, and this syringe pump is programmable, and I've programmed it ahead of time to add this at one milliliter per minute. And if I've done my math right, that'll give us the perfect temperature inside the Vortex Fluidic device. So now that I've got my syringe filled to 20 milliliters, I think that's an average size. I'm going to go ahead and turn on this syringe pump and then load the cocktail. All right, there it goes. Just like I programmed it. Yeah, so this syringe pump is uh, pretty neat. It's programmable, uh, and you can make it with really cheap off-the-shelf components. I worked on this a couple years ago at the University of North Carolina, and all the instructions to make this are online, so if you need to make a syringe pump on the cheap, you can do so. So I've programmed this one so that when it turns on, it pulls the plunger all the way back and then waits for me to load the syringe and then it starts pumping at one milliliter per minute. And so you can get a lot more finesse and control when you program the microcontroller yourself. So this is just about to lock up right now and we'll start to see the anteater punch come out. And I've got an eye on the temperature. It looks pretty good. So I'm going to start this Vortex Fluidic device now. We're spinning at 500 RPM, and the anteater punch is just starting to come out at one milliliter per minute. So this will give us the perfect cocktail. So we programmed this to be two degree, minus two degrees Celsius, which I think is the perfect temperature for a cocktail. If it's too cold, it makes your teeth numb, and that's kind of unpleasant. No one really wants that in a cocktail. But if it's too warm, you definitely detect that too. It tastes more fiery, the run notes come out a lot stronger. So the goal of chilling it is to really change the mouthfeel quite a bit. And so I think minus two degrees Celsius is pretty uh, ideal. Water's property changes in a very interesting way at minus four degrees Celsius. We're right in this very special regime for, for this liquid properties that we're going for. And one of the great things about this setup that Michael's invented is that it gives us a way of really dialing in exactly the temperature. And if we had more time, we'd probably want to investigate that as a variable as well. Maybe not today, this kind of takes a while to, to get to work. So let's take a look uh, at how he's doing now. It's coming in? It's going smoothly. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to increase the rotation to see if we can change the properties of this cocktail. Awesome. So changing the rotation speed changes the uh, amount of mechanical energy that's being input into the solution, helping to break up any ice crystals that form, ensuring that you get the perfect smooth cocktail without adding any diluting ice. You good? What speed are you up to? I'm at 700 RPM. Awesome. Let's take it to a couple thousand. All right. It's only at the really high speeds that we see the interesting properties in terms of shear stress and microfluidics that we're going for for this experiment. So it's really essential that we get past the uh, few hundred RPMs, get into the thousands. All right, I think this might we can. Have, I think we can declare this one a success. <laughs> I think so too. That looks pretty darn good. Let's stop this. Okay. And now I want to check and see how many little tiny crystals appear in the solution because I contend that tiny crystals are better than big crystals for, oh, that's perfect. Okay, so let's filter that into here. I have this narrow filter. All right, so here we go. All right, so. So look, there are no little ice crystals in here. And when we make the one, uh, we're gonna make another one using the classic conventional shaker, the uh, cocktail shaker. That's not gonna be as good. This is, gives us a zero ice crystals, really effective way to nicely chill a cocktail. This is a great way to chill a cocktail if you can adjust the kinetic energy, the mechanical energy appropriately. It's a little more work perhaps, but I, I think it's worth it because clearly we didn't get any ice crystals and we avoided diluting the cocktail in the first place. This is a great way to do it. Thank you, Michael, for making this possible. Thanks, great Mary. invention. We're gonna have to publish that one. Definitely. Maybe not for cocktails. We'll come up with something else. I have a different plan. So I hate to admit this, but that lovely drink that we made in my laboratory, cooled by the specially constructed Vortex Fluidic device, yeah, that one we threw down the drain. I couldn't bring myself to drink it because we're in a laboratory, 
And our laboratory uses a lot of different chemicals and a lot of different microbes. And so for all those reasons, we poured it away. We're now outside on a beautiful day uh, and we're going to make, it, make a version that we can actually drink out of outside the laboratory. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce a super talented uh, graduate student in my laboratory. I like to think of graduate students and students at UCI as California's greatest natural resource. So California's greatest natural resource, Tia, <laughs> introduce yourself to us. Please. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Tia. I'm a first year pharmaceutical sciences graduate uh, student. I'm currently rotating with Dr. Weiss. Uh, and I've been learning so much in Dr. Weiss's lab and as much as I've got a lot of uh, learning experience for pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacology, we're exploring a new route and today we're gonna teach you guys a little bit about mixology. So I'm super excited to help you guys out and learn with you. Awesome, I'll let you do it. Perfect. Go ahead. So to reiterate, and I'm learning along, along with you guys, so I think this is gonna be a good videographic type of thing. You know, we're learning together. We're gonna start off with two and a half ounces of mango juice or mango nectar and add that to a shaker full of ice. So ice is everything for good cocktails. Don't uh, hold back on ice. Fill the whole thing up with ice. You can't get enough ice for a good cocktail. My exposure to cocktails so far have been drinking them. And <laughs> so this is, this is new for me as well. And next we're gonna add one and a half ounces of lime juice. We've shaken the lime juice in advance. It kind of settles. If you're not careful, that could be a problem. And we're gonna add that in. Awesome. And then we're going to add an ounce and a half of our honey mixture. If you're inventing cocktails at home, always think about like one to one ratios of lime juice to sweet stuff. All right. Drop that in. And Dr. Weiss, I'm gonna need your help reminding me ah, about this step. Okay, so we start start at the 151. All right. Just a quarter ounce, please, if you, if you will. <laughs> sure. <Thank> you. <laughs> we do still have to work after this, everybody. That's right. All right. Okay. And I believe it's the clear rum after that. Uh, yeah. Okay. And just go up to two ounces on the clear rum. Okay. This clear rum is delicious and it just doesn't have as much complexity as the darker rums, but it's, it's tasty stuff nonetheless. And it helps keep the color of the cocktail even. All right. Goes in there. Color's looking good. Looking good so far. And then, was it this one? Let's or? use this one. Sure. And that's going to be the remaining ounce. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to glug, glug, glug. Perfect. Perfect. It's gonna be very tasty. Okay, so now one thing is you don't have to get so elaborate on the rums and you don't need multiple layers of rum. If you're in your grocery store and you just pick up whatever rum uh, is on the shelf, you're gonna be fine. Okay, back to you. Shake them up. Oh, let's add more ice. Add more, more ice. ice. Oh yeah, yeah, let's get it all the way to the top. You can't Please. add too much ice. That's why he's here. <laughs> here we go. Okay. Oh, that smells so good through the mask. And we're going to shake that up. I wish I could smile through the mask. But <laughs> okay. Right. Now, because we're scientists, we have to turn this into an experiment. Okay, so I'm having Tia pour off half of the stuff that she's just made. And that's going to be our control. Sounds and good. And then we're going to have an experimental group. Ooh, that looks tasty. About there? A little uh, more? A little more. A little more. Yeah, that's good. All right. Okay. Now, to the experimental one, she's going to add two shakes of bitters. I contend that the bitters uh, add a little bit more taste complexity because it goes back to the flavor balance that we talked about earlier. Okay, awesome. Great. And... Uh, so this one, let's give that a quick swirl. Sure. This. Okay. And now uh, let's pour off that one. Do, do you think we got this mixed enough? I think so. Okay, great. All right. Uh, we've now cooled everything. We're ready for the uh, sparkling water. So we have 50% that has bitter, 50% no bitter. So the goal here is to see if there's a difference between the two. And uh, I have a bunch of testers 
uh, some of them behind the camera. They're going to help us determine that experimentally. Okay, so uh, how much uh, of this last ingredient of sparkling water? I believe it was one ounce. Okay, so the, the one ounce just kind of leavens the drink, takes away some of the headiness, uh, again, changes the viscosity slightly, uh, also makes it a slightly easier and more fizzy, fizzy drink to drink. It's a little more delightful, I would say. Okay, here we go. So let's do half an ounce. We'll put half in here and then half another one. Sure. So I think we're ready for the experiment to test this hypothesis that a more even flavor, a more balanced flavor with the bitters is more tasty. But, you know, I don't want to bias the experiment. So I've uh, recruited one of the super talented undergrads in my laboratory, Gabby, to help us with this. And um, she's going to then blind the experiment so that as the tasters are drinking the different drinks, they won't know whether or not they have the balanced version or the, the version without the bitters. And uh, I should probably not even use language like balanced or unbalanced because that starts to bias our population. <laughs> so uh, Gavi is going to be blinding all the experiments. So what you're going to do is you'll aliquot the stuff using, here's the bitter one, here's the non-bitter one. Yes. And she has a syringe so she can precisely deliver the same amount. And we're going to try tiny little quantities because again, we have to come back and uh, get back to work. So right. without further ado, okay, go ahead, Gavi. Great, so I will be um, randomly putting in bitter and non-bitter uh, drinks into these cups and our, um, I guess, our individuals, our participants will be taking a crack at what they're drinking. So let me go ahead and start uh, blindly putting in the drinks into their cups. So while Gabby is doing that, let me just tell you that taste is one of those incredibly subjective uh, human experiences. So I've come up with a 10 point scale where lowest numbers are most favorable. And it's sort of like golf, you wanna have the lowest number. And uh, our tasters today are gonna to be using a 10 point scale. Nine is, I would never ever wanna drink that. One is, wow, that's perfection itself. And then four or five, 4.5 is, that's okay. Okay, so that's just, you know, C grade in the middle. Okay, and um, we'll be doing this multiple times. Uh, each of us will be doing this multiple times. So we'll get enough replicates enough experiments to get a statistically significant population to be able to determine whether or not this is working. So Gabby, I'm intensely curious to know, <laughs> how did our experiment turn out? Do people prefer the balanced drink? So actually, for the bitters, yes. the average was a five, and for the non-bitters, the average was a 3.9. Oh my <laughs> so people actually prefer without the bitters? So is the... I guess so, yeah. yeah. Wow, okay. So there you have it. Uh, you know, we did the experiment. And uh, the difference in the two numbers, uh, we'd have to do a power law calculation. But I estimate that we have enough uh, data to be able to say that. It seems to be... Mm -hmm. um, There's uh, five Do you have the standard deviation? No, I okay. do We'll, we'll have to look at the data a little more closely, but I think, you know, preliminarily, I would say the non-bitter version seems to be more popular amongst our six tasters. Yes. Wow, okay, <laughs> good to know, thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. All right, and now, Gabby is going to make the non-alcoholic version of the drink, but before we do, Gabby, maybe I can ask you to introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, yes, of course. Thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Gabby, and I am a third year undergraduate at, uh, here at the Uni University of California, Irvine, and I've been doing research since my first year. And research in the lab has been so inspiring that I really want to obtain a PhD when I graduate. So I'll be applying next fall, and yeah. You, you, don't, you can't see this, but I'm grinning. I'm so thrilled and so proud of Gabby. So talented. <laughs> Thank you great. very much. Yeah, you're welcome. So Gabby is going to make the non-alcoholic version of this drink because Gabby's under 21. <laughs> so she's perfect to, to Not make the non-alcoholic version. Here we go. Here's your Boston shaker yeah. and uh, lots of ice. Go for it. So I'll fill this up with ice. Yeah, tons of ice, Gabby. You never have enough ice. For this. <laughs> Here we go. So two and a half ounces of, of mango juice. Mango juice. And then one and a half of lime. Yeah. So I found that you could take almost any tiki drink and convert it into non-alcoholic version by replacing the rum with fizzy water, with sparkling water. That seems to work pretty well. Um, 
truthfully, the, uh, I should say it works well that none of my guests have complained. But uh, truthfully, I don't know whether I'd be drinking that version myself. But anyway, if you do, this works reasonably well. <laughs> um, same principles apply. Layering flavors, uh, the balance between sweet and sour. And I also still maintain some bitter is useful, though our testing hasn't, born, hasn't uh, shown that to be the case just yet. Uh, I think that's it, right? And I guess no bitters. Yeah. We decided no bitters based on the data. You know, you can't fight, uh, can't fight what the data tells us, right? Exactly. Okay, so go ahead and shake it up. All right. Awesome. Yikes. Okay, I have this cocktail. Do you know how to use the strainer? No. So you put that on top of this, and then yeah. you just pour, uh, and we'll just line up some glasses. This is the part where we add the seltzer. So after you chill it, then you add the seltzer, okay? So it's three ounces of seltzer. Into before, here? Before, yeah. So Oops. the reason we're doing it this way is if you shake it with the seltzer, you lose all the bubbles, and the bubbles add a little bit of effervescence. Uh, it just makes it a little more fizzy, a little more fun. Okay. There we go. And let's give it a quick swirl just to mix it. Uh, of course, I don't have a bar spoon. Uh, usually you use a bar spoon. Um, Okay, yes, we'll use the paper umbrella. Okay, <laughs> that's perfect. Awesome. Okay, I think you're ready to use the cocktail strainer. Great. Thank you. So that goes on top. And... Awesome, thank you, that's good. Try this. Hmm. Oh, that's delicious. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It really is delicious. It Antigers looks delicious. Punch, the non-alcoholic version is excellent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. I hope uh, you go home and make some anteaters punch for yourself. And we're gonna close with some zots. All right, one, two, three. Zot, zot, zot. zot. zot.